Uh, so I want to preface my talk with the admission that I'm not an expert on the thought of St. Thomas or of Aristotle. So if I say things that are incorrect about them, I hope the real experts will correct me gently. <laughs> <laughs> now, this symposium is about how Thomistic philosophy relates to natural science. There is, this is, however, a subsidiary question. The primary question to which it's relevant is the consistency of Catholic doctrine to natural science. Our faith, specifically Catholic faith and modern science compatible. I've been dealing with that, with science faith issues on a personal level since I was a child, but in a public way since 1995 when I started writing about them, uh, mostly in the journal First Things. In 2003, I wrote a book called Modern Physics and Ancient Faith, and since then I've given well over 100 public lectures on science and faith, mostly on college campuses. As a result, I've been asked many questions over the years by Catholics and sometimes Protestants struggling with these issues and even by a few atheists. These questions that have come in question and answer sessions after my talks or in emails to me or in private conversations. So I have, I've been down in the trenches, so to speak, as I, uh, as I know some of you also have been. I think we're coming at this from a somewhat practical point of view, as well as theoretical. What ideas, concepts, and modes of expression are most helpful to people today in sorting out the science faith issues that concern them? And what ideas, concepts, and modes of expression are not so helpful? and maybe even a hindrance for them. Let me clarify that when I say science faith issues, I'm focusing specifically on such questions as why we should believe in God at all, whether the universe is created, and whether we have spiritual souls and free will. I'm not talking about questions of bioethics, the nature of human sexuality, the proper uses of technology, the stewardship of creation, and so on. These are, these are also very important, but that is not my part of the trenches. The science faith questions that concern most educated Catholics today are not simple questions of scientific fact or historical fact, such as the age of the earth, which are paramount for Christians, fundamentalist Christians, with a narrowly literalistic interpretation, the way of reading the Bible. The questions that concern Catholics tend to be more subtle and necessarily require philosophical analyses and concepts and distinctions to think clearly about and to answer. Here are some of those questions. Do scientific ideas about how the universe began undercut arguments for a creator? Do the naturalistic explanations of modern science leave less room for explanations that invoke God? Can one believe in the lawful universe of modern science and also in miracles? Does the role of chance in evolution mean that we must revise our ideas about God's omniscience, omnipotence, and particular providence? Can neurons explain everything about our minds? And if so, what happens to free will and the spiritual soul? Such questions cannot be answered by an experiment or by a calculation. Nor can they be resolved simply by an appeal to reveal truth. The questions require philosophical analysis. Philosophy is where faith and science meet. That being so, which philosophical systems and ideas are most helpful in dealing with science faith issues that concern people today? Different people would give different answers. There exist people who find helpful the ideas of Teilhard de Chardin, or process theology, or open theism, or something called non-reductive materialism. In my opinion, those ideas lead to confusion rather than clarity, and themselves have problems of consistency with Catholic doctrine, or with modern science, or in some cases, with themselves. In my view, the keys to sorting out many of the science faith issues in a way that comports best with modern science and with the teachings of the faith 
are certain insights found in St. Thomas, St. Thomas Aquinas. Though, of course, these insights are not completely original to him, he built upon much older foundations. Part of those foundations was Aristotle. Here, I think the picture is more mixed. I think that in our present context, Aristotle is very helpful in science faith discussions in some respects and with some questions, indeed vital, but a significant hindrance in other respects. Some might object to this on the ground that if you take St. Thomas, you have to take Aristotle with him, for better or worse. For St. Thomas, <clears throat> well, I would agree that that is true of some Aristotle, but not all of Aristotle. Thomas himself certainly departed from Aristotle on very important points. And much in St. Thomas comes from sources other than Aristotle, preeminently, of course, biblical revelation, the Church Fathers, especially St. Augustine, and even non-Christian non thinkers, great non-Christian thinkers such as Avicenna. Moreover, I think the insights in St. Thomas that are most valuable in sorting out the science faith issues of the kind I'm talking about are not tied particularly closely to Aristotelianism. They can be understood and expressed without using Aristotelian concepts and categories. So the rest of my talk has two parts. In the first part, I'm going to tell you some of the places I think St. Thomas is most helpful on science faith issues. In the second part, I'm going to mention some of the ways in which I think Aristotle can be, and indeed has been, a hindrance. I may expand on what I was going to say. I didn't want to be negative in my talk, so I want to focus mostly on St. Thomas and the good things. And I was going to say less about Aristotle and some of the problematic things, but I have been provoked by Bill, so <laughs> I, might, I might expand a little bit on what I think so. I'll start with the question of how modern cosmology's ideas about the beginning of the universe relate to Catholic teaching on the creation of the universe. This question arises in many ways. Some atheists point to speculative scenarios in modern cosmology in which the universe has no temporal beginning as showing that a creator is not needed. Some of these scenarios posit a history of the universe extending infinitely into the past. Another scenario, I'll call those a past infinite universe. Another scenario, favored by the late Stephen Hawking, supposes that the age of the universe is finite, but that there is no identifiable first moment of time, because the very notion of the sequential time breaks down in what one might call the universe's embryonic stage. Hawking thought that if there was no identifiable, precise first moment in time in which God could insert his finger, so to speak, then there could be no moment of creation either. Some atheists point to scenarios where the universe has, has a beginning, uh, but in which the universe, quote, creates itself out of nothingness through what is called the quantum fluctuation. On the other hand, some Christian apologists point to the presumed fact that the universe had a beginning in time as philosophical proof that it was created. An example is the so-called Kalam argument, popular K-A-L-A-M. Kalam argument popularized and championed by the evangelical Protestant philosopher and theologian William Lane Craig. This argument has two steps. First, it is argued on philosophical grounds that the universe, in fact, must have had a temporal beginning. One argument for this is based on the premise that a so called actual infinity is an impossible. The second step of the Kalam argument is that anything that has a temporal beginning must have a cause of its beginning. And for the universe, that cause can only be something that is not part of the universe. 
This line of argument is also one of those that I believe adopted by uh, Father Robert Spitzer in his book, New Proofs for the Existence of God, a book that I hasten to say has many good things in it. Aside from philosophers and theologians, many ordinary people look upon the Big Bang as the creation event, and thus proving creation. They, they see its discovery as a directly proving the doctrine of creation. As tempting as this simple identification of the temporal beginning of the world with the creation of the world may be, it is a mistake. I think it is philosophically a mistake, but I also think it is apologetically dangerous. For it plays directly into the hands of atheists who either argue that there was no temporal or that physics can explain in that beginning. One enormous contribution of St. Thomas was to distinguish very clearly between the temporal beginning of the universe and its creation. That he did so is very clear from the fact that although he thought that it was possible to prove philosophically that the universe has a creator, it is created and has a creator, it is not possible to prove philosophically that it had a temporal beginning. Or at least, he didn't think that any of the arguments people had employed up to that point to prove that the universe had a temporal beginning were compelling. <clears throat> he argued that even a universe that was past infinite would require a creator, and, and, and that indeed God had the power to create such a past infinite though he had chosen, in fact, as we know from Revelation, to create, to give the universe the beginning of time. St. Thomas's positions on these questions were different from those of some other important scholastic philosophers, such as his teacher, St. Albert the Great, and St. Bonaventure. St. Bonaventure believed that the creation of the universe implies that, it's, that it is past in past finite, that it had a, a temporal beginning. He thought that a created past infinite universe is a philosophical contradiction. Moreover, St. Bonaventure presented a series of philosophical arguments that a past infinite universe is an impossibility. One of these arguments was that if the universe were past infinite, each new day would be in addition to that and it is impossible to add to infinity. But he also, Bonaventure also argued that if past time were infinite, there would have to have been particular past times, let's call them days, particular days, that were infinitely far into the past, in the past which is mathematically balanced. So an infinite past time meant there had to be particular days that were infinitely and if they were such days, there could not have been a transit from them to our present day because the day after that infinitely remote day would still be infinitely remote. And the day after that would still be infinitely remote. And so by a process of reduction with all the days that followed it, which means you can never get to now. Well, any people familiar with modern mathematics knows that these kinds of paradoxes about infinity are well understood today. They don't prove anything. <laughs> And, but uh, what's impressive is that St. Thomas answered these and showed that they were fallacious. And that's pretty impressive in the 13th century, before uh, much was understood about mathematics. So St. Thomas rejected these kinds of arguments. The distinction between the beginning and the creation of the universe is extre an extremely important one in the context of present science debates. Now, the way I explain the, this, this distinction to people, to audiences, is through an analogy of a novel or a play or a symphony. The beginning of a novel is the words on its first page. The origin of the novel, in the sense of its ultimate cause, is the mind of the novelist. The beginning of a symphony are, is its first notes or bars. The origin or cause of the symphony is the mind of the composer. It would be silly 
to answer the question of why there is a particular novel by pointing to its first words. There exists such a novel because of its author. It would be silly to answer the question of why there is a particular symphony by pointing to its first notes. There exists such a symphony because of its composer. Even if the novel had no beginning, for example, imagine a novel whose plot went around in a circle and it was in fact written on a scroll that looped around. So it had no beginning. You still need an author. <coughs> and the same for a piece of music. By analogy, the beginning of the universe is just a set of events that happened about 14 billion years ago, if the Big Bang was the beginning. The origin or cause of the universe is God. To say that God is creator is to say that he is the reason there is a universe. He is the source of its being, or the causa ascendi. As St. Thomas says, to all things, God is the cause of being. Even if the universe were past infinite, or even if the universe were cyclic in time, it would still be something that had being. It would be real, a real universe. It would exist, it would have being, and there would have to be a source of that being. Therefore, whether the universe had a temple to get, and if so, what events were that unfolded at that temporal beginning, are irrelevant to the deeper question of why does the universe at all. It is that deeper question which the Jewish and Christian doctrine of creation answers. The deeper question was posed by Leibniz in the form, why is there something rather than nothing? That is perhaps the simplest way to express it in a way that is understandable for people today, even in the atheists. So the theories and speculations of modern cosmology are actually quite irrelevant to the question of creation. That is the short and sufficient answer to atheists who think that physics can dispose of the creator. It is a reply made possible by the deep insight one thing that may confuse people is that the Bible itself links beginning and creation. In its first verse, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. But Genesis is not asserting that beginning and creation mean the same thing. There are really several distinct things being taught in that verse of the Bible. The Catechism of the Catholic Church itself points this out. In section 290, the Catechism says, quote, Three things are expressed in these first words of Scripture. The eternal God gave a beginning to all that exists outside himself. He alone is creator. And the totality of what exists, expressed in the, by the formula of the heavens and the earth, depends on the one who gives it being. A second area of science faith issues where the insights of St. Thomas are critically important has to do with the relation of natural causes to God as cause. Many people, both atheists and religious people, <coughs> think that God as cause and natural causes are in competition with each other. God is for them just one cause alongside of other causes on the same playing field as it were. That is why many atheists think that by finding natural causes, we leave God with less to do, and that science will eventually put him out of business as the cause of anything. And it is why many religious believers think that the evidence for God must be sought in things that cannot be naturally explained. Examples of this kind of thinking are easy to they're all over the place. Many religious people ask me, have asked me, what caused the universe to expand? They are hoping that I will say that the Big Bang required an explosive force and that God is that force. But of course, if the universe needed a force to make it expand, that force would just be a force of nature. God, however, is not a force of nature, like dynamite or electricity. He is not a part of nature at all, but rather the author of nature. Hawking, 
also suffered from this kind of simplistic thinking about God. He said that if physics could explain how the Big Bang happened, we would no longer need God as a kind of blue touch paper, as he put it, to set off the explosion. The blue touch paper, I take it, being a British term for what we would call a match. To take another example, Philip Johnson, the godfather of the intelligent design movement, wrote several books attacking Darwinian evolution. And one of his main contentions, one of his main beliefs, was that the naturalism of modern science was inherently atheistic. Now, of course, in philosophy, the term naturalism usually refers to the proposition that only natural phenomena and natural causes exist, which is atheistic. But what Philip Johnson was complaining about was merely the idea that natural science can explain the phenomena of the natural world without invoking God explicitly. I wrote an article on evolution once in First Things, in, in which at one point at one point in the article I expressed some puzzlement that many religious people, the fundamentalists, Many religious people object to the natural explanations of the origin of plants and animals given by evolutionary biology, whereas one rarely heard them object to the natural explanation of the origin of stars and planets given by astrophysics. A very well-known public figure, who's admirable in many ways, but I don't want to embarrass him by mentioning his name here, criticized me in a letter to the editor of First Things. And this is what he wrote, in part. Is it possible that a man of Barr's education really wonders why some of us would not accept a natural explanation for the formation of stars and planets in light of the discoveries made possible by the Hubble Space Telescope? A Big Bang presupposes a force that brought all of this into being, that is God, in parentheses. People who believe that there is a natural explanation for the formation of stars, the planetary system, plants and animals are by definition naturalists. Neo-Darwinists Neo have made it clear that they presuppose a natural beginning to the universe. That is, no God. I just want to interpret it and to put one little comment in here. There's nothing wrong with saying, theologically saying the beginning of the universe was natural, if by that you mean that the events that occurred really processes that unfolded at the beginning of the universe obey the laws of nature. Why wouldn't they? You would expect the word, first words of a novel to obey the laws of grammar just as much as the later words of the novel. The laws of nature are like the grammar of the universe in some sense. And you'd expect the first events to be just as much in accordance with the laws of physics as the later events. It didn't have to be a breakdown of the laws of nature or the natural order there. In that sense, the beginning of the universe can be, can be and one would expect, to be perfectly natural. But that, that, that's just an aside. But what causes such deeply confused thinking on the part of both atheists and some religious believers is they don't understand or have never heard of the crucial distinction between primary and secondary causality. I think that by the way, that is one of the main sources of, of, of scientific atheism failure to understand this distinction. Now, while I don't think St. Thomas invented this distinction, he certainly developed and elaborated these concepts. And then the way I explain the, this idea, these ideas to audiences, lay audiences, is with the same analogy of a novel or a play that I used before. Consider Dostoevsky's novel, Crime and Punishment. In it, the character Raskolnikov, as I recall, murders an old pawnbroker with an axe. So I ask the audiences to vote. I say, all of you who think the old pawnbroker died because Raskolnikov struck her with an axe, raise your hands. So, yes, I'll only get few, even though I just told them. That's what happens. <laughs> <laughs> no, they, 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 they say, all who think that the old pawnbroker died because Dostoevsky wrote the novel that way, raise your hands. Some, most audiences laugh because they see the absurdity, they see the joke. Obviously, 
both Raskolnikov and Dostoevsky are causes of the pawnbroker's death. Raskolnikov striking the pawnbroker with an axe is the cause within the plot of the novel. Call it the horizontal cause. Whereas Dostoevsky is the cause of the novel in its entirety, including its characters and events, including the causal relationships, uh, including the relationships among those characters and events, including the causal relationships within the plot. Call Dostoevsky the vertical cause. Dostoevsky and Raskolnikov are not in competition. Indeed, Raskolnikov is the cause of the pawnbroker's death precisely because Dostoevsky wrote that into the plot. Dostoevsky is the cause of all causes within his novel. In an analogous way, the natural causes of events within the universe that scientists and everybody else studies are horizontal causes, or in the language of theology, secondary causes. Whereas God, as the author of the universe, is the vertical cause, or in the language of theology, the primary cause. So God's causality is not in competition with natural causality. While God can bypass natural causality and cause events to happen in the universe that have no natural cause or even are contrary to what natural causes would produce, such as water turning into wine, God is equally and fully the cause of all natural events. He is therefore to be seen not only in the supernatural or in the miraculous departures from the order of nature, but in so-called or in so-called interventions into nature, but also in nature itself. I want to note something about the two crucial insights of Thomistic philosophy that I just discussed, namely the distinction between beginning and creation, and the distinction between primary and secondary causality. You do not need Aristotelian terminology to explain them. They, are not essentially, they do not essentially depend on an Aristotelian framework. In fact, the distinction between the beginning and creation of the universe cannot even be discussed within the thought of Aristotle himself. Because A, he did not believe the universe was created. He did not have a creator God. And B, he did not believe the universe had a beginning. If you'd asked Aristotle to distinguish the creation and the beginning of the universe, he would probably not have known what you were talking about. The fact that one doesn't need Aristotle to explain these ideas is, very, is a very good thing. Because understanding Aristotle takes a lot of work. One has to master a great deal of technicalities and jargon, which I certainly have not fully mastered. But unless one is dealing with professional philosophers and theologians, it is best to avoid technicalities and jargon as much as possible, and to make use of simple analogies and ordinary language. St. Thomas himself constantly used analogies. Richard Feynman once said that if you cannot explain something simply, then you don't really understand it well. That's not always true, but it is often true. If you find yourself explaining things to lay people using lots of jargon, then you probably don't understand what you're talking about yourself. There are many other science faith issues on which the thought of St. Thomas sheds much light. Just to take one example, there are people who think that the role of chance in evolutionary history somehow is inconsistent, random mutation, is inconsistent with divine providence and with God, God knowing the future and being in complete control of events. How could God be in control of everything and know everything from all eternity if things are happening by chance? They should read Book 3, Chapter 24 of St. Thomas' Summa Contra Gentiles, which is entitled, quote, That Divine Providence Does Not Exclude Fortune and Chance. I could go on and give other examples of issue after issue. St. Thomas is the go-to guy, and St. Augustine, I must say, because a lot of what St. Thomas said that was good and valuable, that helps in science, was really understood and articulated by St. Augustine. Now, I will turn to some comments about Aristotle, and here I'm going to be the skunk in the garden party, <laughs> uh, about, about Aristotle and contemporary science-based issues. The first point I'll make is historical. 
matter how much time do I have? You started late, so I don't know you lost time. But when I have the hand, it's only about 42. 11.42? Okay, I'll speak it up. I want to make historical point. In 13th century Europe, Aristotle's enormous prestige rested to a great extent on his reputation as a scientist. The word scientist was only invented in the 19th century. What we call natural science was then called natural philosophy and continued to be called that for many centuries. That's why the full title of Newton's Principia was The Mathematical Principles of Natural Philosophy. What we would say the mathematical principles of science means the mathematical principles of natural philosophy. As you may know, St. Thomas referred to Aristotle as simply the philosopher. But to people of that time, in the Latin West anyway, Aristotle was also, in a very real sense, the scientist. Aristotle was regarded as the man who understood better than anyone before or since how nature worked. So to a large extent, science at that time was Aristotle. Consequently, to show the consistency of faith in science, meant showing the consistency of the Catholic faith and Aristotle. That is what St. Thomas, to a great extent, accomplished. But we're in a very different situation today. Contemporary science, and I want to emphasize, this is certainly true of the physical sciences. I can really only talk with some authority on physical sciences, physics. Contemporary science no longer thinks in Aristotelian categories or uses Aristotelian terminology. Aristotle has disappeared from physics in a way that Newton, for example, has not. In order to understand quantum mechanics and general relativity and modern physics in general, one first has to have mastered so-called classical physics, which includes Newtonian mechanics and gravity. Newton's insights are and always will be part of the edifice of physics. And much of his conceptual apparatus is still completely valid. Ideas such as force, acceleration, momentum, and so on. But it is utterly unnecessary to know anything about Aristotelian science or Aristotelian, or Aristotelian philosophy to do physics. And that has been so for centuries. That does not mean that Aristotelian philosophy is wrong. There are many things that are true that one does not need to know about in order to understand and do physics, for example. The physical sciences have parted company with Aristotle and gone their own way. They have developed over the last few hundred years their own concepts and technical vocabulary. It is entirely right and proper and indeed necessary that they should have done this. There's not, and nor is there anything, whatever, wrong with the way they have done this. The concepts and terminology that have been developed within physics, chemistry, and so on, are those that have been found to be needed to express clearly and precisely, and accurately and unambiguously, the things that have been discovered and understood about nature. So in our present situation, showing the consistency of the Catholic faith with natural science, the physical sciences anyway, is no longer simply a matter of using Aristotelianism as the common framework. <clears throat> Since the physical sciences make virtually no use of Aristotelian categories, concepts, and terminology, their use no longer automatically facilitates communication between theology and the physical sciences, as once it did. But often does the opposite, that is, it creates an additional language barrier. I think most scientists who, who have sat down to read the Summa Theologiae or Aristotle's Physics will immediately know what I'm talking about. If one is addressing people in the vast world of, of scientific, in addressing the vast world of scientifically oriented people, which is much larger than the world of actual scientists, one cannot expect them to learn all about acting, potency, substance, and acting in substantial form, first matter, second matter, and so forth. Requiring discussions of science-based issues to be conducted in Aristotelianese 
would be as helpful in practice as requiring them to be conducted in Esperanto or Mandarin Chinese. It, besides the fact that few people would have the time, I'm, 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 again, I'm talking about addressing people in our contemporaries who are struggling, with, LA people are struggling with science based. Besides the fact that few people would have the time to master the new language, there's the fact that when one tries to translate the ideas of modern science into Aristotelian terms, much gets lost in translation. One attempt to carry out such a translation was made by the Dominican priest, a Dominican priest named William A. Wallace, a leading representative of what is called the River Forest School of Atonism in a book entitled the Model Modeling of Nature, written in 1996. For years, I was told by Thomas friends that this was the book to read on Thomas and modern science. I finally got the time to read it, and I learned a lot from it. Wallace does show that one might describe some of what modern science has discovered, in our, even in the physical sciences, in Aristotelian terms. But I think most physicists reading that book would find his approach somewhat forced and not fully convincing. They'd find it artificial, if I may use that term. The categories in which modern physicists think and those in which Aristotle thought are just too different for there to be any simple direct translation. However, I think there is a way to overcome the language barrier, and I will come back to it shortly if I have time. But here I want to interject something that's not in my prepared remarks, which is I don't think it's just a question of a language barrier. I think there actually are conceptual conflicts or mismatches between, say, Aristotelian philosophy of nature and, and the insights and uh, truths and, and ideas of modern physical sciences. I'll get back to that at the end if I have time. A second problem is that some of Aristotle's science was simply wrong, which is only to be expected. I'll give one example, which actually makes a big difference in discussions of biological evolution. Aristotle's conception of biological species had the following feature. If A and B are of the same species, and B and C are of the same species, then A and C are of the same species. In other words, there is a transitivity property. In the terminology of modern mathematics, one would say that being of the same species was, for Aristotle, an equivalence relation. And the species, as a result, the species themselves were equivalence classes. That, that mathematically implies that one can uniquely categorize all living things into distinct and sharply defined species. But modern biology knows that biological species aren't like that. Defining species, uh, uh, I'm told, and, and is very hard in modern biology, but, but uh, one criterion used by biologists, one criterion uh, to define species in sexually reproducing organisms, is that two organisms are of the same species if they could, in principle, interbreed to produce fertile offspring. Now, that would be a sufficient obviously, not a necessary one. For example, two males or two females of the same species cannot interbreed. I hope we're still allowed to say that. <laughs> but this is not a transitive relation. The fact that type A can interbreed with type B, and type B can interbreed with type C, and type C with type D, and so on, all the way down to type Z, does not imply that type A can interbreed with type Z. Uh, a and B may be just similar enough, <coughs> genetically and in other ways, that they can interbreed. And B and C may be just similar enough, and so on. But A and C may be too different for them to interbreed. So the boundaries between species are inherently fuzzy. If, if, if they could even be defined rigorously at all, an, an example of this that is frequently used by biologists are so-called ring species. Here's the definition from, from the Wikipedia page about ring species. In biology, a ring species 
is a connected series of neighboring populations, each of which can interbreed with closely sighted related populations, but for which there exist two end populations in the series, which are too, dis too distantly related to interbreed, though there is a potential gene flow between each linked population. This is not just what happens in a spatial chain of neighboring it's what happens with the temporal chain that one gets in evolution. A cat would be able, in principle, to interbreed with one of its parents, and its parents could have interbred in principle with its grandparents, and so on back through time. The parent of your dog is, was a dog, and the parent of its dog was a dog. But a cat if you, went, if you considered one of the progenitors of a modern cat a million generations ago, your, your cat and its distant progenitor would be so different that they couldn't interbreed. In fact, one of its progenitors was, was, was a reptile, <laughs> and eventually one of its was a fish. Now, if one conceives of, of species, as Aristotle did, having that transitivity property, and one also assumes that animals produce offspring of the same species as themselves, the conclusion, the conclusion immediately follows that species never change and biological evolution is impossible. And in fact, this isn't just a conclusion that some might draw. It's well known that there are objections from the grounds of Aristotelian philosophy to the idea of evolution of species. It's not just a conclusion that some might draw. A book recently came out by a Polish Dominican priest. I apologize to my Dominican friend for having to point out this. It's Dominican. <laughs> Father Michael Chaparek. In it, he argues that the theory of evolution is inconsistent with the thought of St. Thomas Aquinas. Chaparek presents five lines of argument that this is so all of them based on Aristotelian principles. He's really saying it's inconsistent with Aristotle, and therefore with St. Thomas, and therefore Catholics shouldn't believe in it. I have to say, it's embarrassing enough when people say that the Bible, which is after all God's word, says you shouldn't believe in evolution. Disbelieving evolution because God tells you not to, well, that makes sense because he's God. <laughs> Disbelieving in evolution because Aristotle told you it's insane. <laughs> now, Father Nicanor Ostriaco, I don't know if he's here yet, he's going to speak. Father Nicanor Ostriaco replied to Chaparek in an article in Public Discourse, and later this year, partly through my instigation, Ed Fezzer will respond to Chaparek in first things. I'm looking forward to that. But even so, the fact that serious Catholic scholars should have to spend time arguing in public about whether Aristotle allows a Catholic to believe in that the species evolved is a vivid illustration of how Aristotelianism can be a severe hindrance rather than a help in dealing with faith science questions. It's not just a question of Aristotle being wrong at the level of scientific fact. Many great scientists have been wrong about matters of scientific fact. His philosophical principles are bound up with this. Why is it true for Aristotle that being of the same species has the transitivity problem? It follows from the fact that for him, two things are of the same species because they have the same substantial form. If A and B have the same substantial form, and B and C have the same substantial form, it follows that A and C have the same substantial form. So if you're thinking in terms of the substantial form, you get into this problem. So the mistakes in Aristotle's science are bound up with his philosophy. And that is because one's philosophical ideas, and here I disagree, I think, a bit with Bill, Professor Carroll. And that's because one's philosophical ideas are, to a large extent, a function of one's science. One renowned Thomist, who I think has emphasized this fact, I've not finished it the late Father Benedict Ashley, OP, another Dominican priest, another representative of the River Forest School of Thomism. In his last book, The Way Towards Wisdom, which came out in 2009, I think makes this point that philosophical ideas are a function to some extent of their science. 
science and are not independent of it. You can't have a philosophical system that is totally impervious to what the scientists reveal to you about the way the world actually is. I believe that modern Thomists are divided on this point. Some Thomists agree, would agree with Ashley or would take this position, and others may would may take opposite. Now, if this is right, as I'm convinced it is, then Aristotelianism has to be reworked and reformulated in light of what we've learned about the natural world. In the process of this reworking, one would expect its concepts and terminology to develop in a way that meshes somewhat better with those of science. That is, the language barrier would be narrowed and perhaps eliminated. One person who did enormously important work in this direction, in my opinion, is the Jesuit philosopher Bernard J. F. Lonergan, especially in his brilliant book, Insight, A Study of Human Understanding, published in 1957. Lonergan is classified, regarded himself as a Thomist, and is generally classified as a transcendental Thomist. There are many Thomists who deprecate him as being a Kantian in Thomistic clothing. Met most of, I don't think they read him or understood him. I met many people who tell me he was a Kantian, and I asked them if you read him, and they say no. <laughs> Some who have read him say it also. Stanley Yaki sneered at Lonergan as an Aquicantian. But Lonergan was anything but a Kantian. One of his purposes in the book Insight was to vindicate the idea that when we properly use our rational faculties and come to affirm the truth of a proposition, we thereby come to know things as they really are in themselves and not simply appearances. There was no, for him, there was no unknowable luminal at all. Anyway. Um, I, I, I won't talk about Lonergan, I think I just ran out of time, but um, maybe in the discussion section I can tell you what, some of the things. Let me just end with this statement. Uh, well, first, I, I'm not anti-Aristotelian, I'm not attacking Aristotle. I'm, uh, in many areas, I think Aristotelian ideas are indispensable to Catholic philosophy and theology, especially in moral philosophy. A lot of Catholic moral philosophy is in, term, in, in Aristotelian eudaimonistic conception of what is the end of man, what is the good of man, what perfects us, and so on. You can't do, I think, Catholic moral philosophy without some Aristotle. Um, and there's many things about many other areas of Catholic theology where Aristotle is important. I, I think, however, when it comes to the physical sciences, especially, Aristotle is really problematic, and even in biology, as far as I illustrate. And what I would argue, what I would say, I don't really agree that Aristotelian natural philosophy is a bro simply a broader framework within which the discoveries of modern physics are, are fit neatly and smoothly. I don't think that's true. I think there's a real clash. There are real conceptual differences that are not easy to overcome between the way modern physics and, and sees the world and the, the approach of Aristotle natural philosophy. It's not a, a, a nice fit. The world is seen by a physicist nowadays, and I would think by a biologist, but let's say a physicist, is not made up of discrete things, a whole collection of discrete things, each of which has its substantial form and so on. Um, think of the formation of a star, you know, you start the defer to the real astronomers, but you start out with a big ball of gas, gradually over eons, you know, it condenses and all sorts of complicated things happen in a gradual problem. Eventually you end up with a star. Now, is a star a thing? Is the ball of gas a thing? Was there, uh, we don't think of it as things, but the star has a substantial form, a ball of gas has a substantial form, a substantial change. It's not a helpful way to think about this. And it gets into trouble. Another area where it gets, we think Aristotelian categories don't quite fit is the four causes. Materials, uh, formal, final, efficient. If you ask, how does a physicist explain, physicists understand the nature of copper, for example. You know what copper is. You know why it has the properties it does. Why is it shiny? Why does it conduct electricity well? Why does it have a yellowish color? Why does it melt in a certain way? Why does it react chemically? Well, everything about copper that you could ever ask. Science has the tools. 
either knows how to explain it or has the tools to explain it. Those explanations don't fit neatly into the four clauses. They just don't. If I say that it conducts electricity well and I talk about the band structure of the electron orbits of the electron in the, in the conduction electrons in the copper, is that a formal or a final clause? It just doesn't fit very well. But anyway, let me stop here and not ramble on to give you a chance to attack here. And, and, and in response to your questions, I can then ramble on. <laughs>